me. Okay, so last time we, uh, we showed that there are problems that we cannot solve. That we have Church's thesis, and Church's thesis tells us that um, we think that, that, that we have described a sort of final model of what a mechanism can do. And, um, and so that one example of that model is the Turing machine model. And last time we showed that there are problems, functions from the naturals to the naturals. There are numerical behaviors that no Turing machine can compute. There are jobs that you could be asked to do, in, in principle, that no computer can do. So, of course, we, we're not satisfied in this course. We, we like to compute things. We're not satisfied with just, you, you know, there, are, there exist things. We want to, want to know what they are. What, what job can, can a person not do? Okay, so, so we're now on the hunt for give me a job that no person can do. And so uh, our, first, our first step in that hunt is to examine, uh, examine this, uh, this particular feature of uh, Turing machines called universality, particular feature of computing devices called universality. And it goes something like this. Uh, uh, imagine, uh, if you will, where we are with Turing machines right now. Uh, I might say to you, well, uh, you know, I need Turing machine number 408, and you'd say, okay, uh, I'll, 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 get you, I'll get you that. And you, you go into your, you know, your workshop in the back room, you figure out what Turing machine 408 is, you do the binary number decomposition, you convert the, the, uh, the exponents in the, in the binary decomposition into instructions, and then you make a device with various gears and levers that, uh, that acts as that Turing machine, and you, say, you come out of the back room and you say, here it is, Turing machine number 408. And I said, oh, I, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. I, I got it wrong. I need number number 407. And you go, you know. So anyway, you go in the back room and you produce Turing machine number 407 and et cetera, and clearly there's got to be a better way. And indeed there is. Those steps that I just described going in the back room can be done uniformly. That is to say, there is a program that can do them. A program can, given the 408 or the 407 or whatever is the input number, a program can decompose it into its binary components, figure out what are the exponents in the binary expansion. You, from those exponents, produce instructions. And now you've got the associated Turing machine. So there is a program that can, given the index, produce the associated Turing machine, we, we call that an acceptable numbering earlier. Anyway, there is a program that does that. And why can't you just run that Turing machine on a Turing machine simulator? I mean, obviously, you can write a program that simulates a Turing machine where you give it the instructions and, and it, why can't you, why can't you make a new program that simply takes the 408, figures out which Turing machine it is, and then runs it on a simulator? Why can't you do that? So that you don't have to produce a new machine every time. You just produce the 408, that's all. Oh, well, you can do that. Turing was the first one who showed in great detail how you do that. There is a Turing machine that. There is a single program that, when given the input E and X, will have the same output behavior as does Turing machine E on input X. That's called the universal Turing machine. So there's a single Turing machine that we can tell, act like this other machine with this, with this, this particular input, and it'll do that. We don't need infinitely many machines. We don't need a back room. We just need this one. That's called the universal Turing machine. I, I write UP for the universal Turing machine, but it's just, it's just a symbol. There's no particular, uh, no particular symbol. You can use whatever you like. So a universal Turing machine is kind of like a, a, an interpreter. So if you, for example, pop up the Python interpreter and you get a prompt and it's waiting for you to enter instructions, you didn't have to compile it, get a binary, and then when you, when you run, want to run different instructions, you, you compile that and get a different binary. No, 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 this one binary will run whatever you want. 
a universal Turing machine is also like an operating system in that if you want to run a program on your operating system, you just say, you know, run program. You don't have, you double click. You, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to pull out a physical part of the Turing machine and replace it with a new physical part of the Turing machine. No, 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 this is not a change in hardware. This is, you just tell it, I want to run program 408 and it figures out what is program 408 and then it runs it. That's what a universal Turing machine does. It is a single device that will act like any other device you want it to act like. Pretty cool. This, this converts from doing jobs in hardware to doing them in software. No longer do you have to go in the back room and produce a physical Turing machine number 408. Now, instead, you run them all on this one device, this Turing machine simulator. A point that I, I found often causes some confusion is that the universal machine doesn't get as input a Turing machine. Instead, it gets as input a 408. You say, I want you to be like, not here's the machine I want you to be like, but rather I want you to be like Turing machine number 408. So it gets the index of a Turing machine, which of course is equivalent to some representation of that machine. But, it, but the point is that you're not sort of feeding a machine into the end of the machine, you're feeding it a number. That's what it says up here. You give it the number, the number of the Turing machine and also the number of the in input. And then it will, it will have the output behavior will be the same as the machine you specify given that input. So a, a universal machine does not get as input a Turing machine. Instead, it gets the index of the Turing machine. And yes, the a universal Turing machine is a perfectly good Turing machine, so it has a perfectly good index, and you could feed the universal Turing machine its own index. Suppose, for example, you had a Python interpreter. There you are. You're looking at the prompt. Could you feed it the source code of Python? I know the source code of Python is C, but let's imagine. Could you feed it its own source code? Yeah, you could. You could. You could. Interesting ideas. Uh, the second topic that I want to talk about today relies on universality. So it's an immediate application for us of universality. And again, it's, it's something that we need right now because we want to talk about what what is a program that you cannot, excuse me, what is a problem that you cannot solve? We found out there are problems you can't solve, but we want a specific one. Don't just tell me they're out there. Give me a specific one. Okay, so in order to give you a specific one, I need two things. I, I need universality and I need this next idea. So here we go, partial evaluation. Suppose I start with a two input function and I wrote it in Python just, just, just because it's awfully straightforward to write it in Python, so I did. It's, uh, it's the power function. You remember the power function from when we did, uh, where we did primitive recursive functions. It takes in a base and an exponent and it returns the base uh, raised to the power of the exponent. I, it's not supposed to be complicated because I'm trying to illustrate something. Now, you could write a family of functions. You could use power here to write a family of functions. Power one that returns power base one. Power two returns power base two. We think of that as the squaring function. Power 3 returns power base 3, so that's the cubing function. That is to say, by freezing one of the arguments, you get a family of functions. Power, base, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. Okay, so we partially evaluated the power function. We didn't evaluate the base part, but we evaluated the exponent part. I told, I, I told the machine, I, I, want to, I want to run the power function, but I want to run it with a fixed exponent. I want to run the power function, I want to run it with a fixed exponent. Okay, so, so partially evaluate the two input power function and make it into a family of one input power functions. The variable in that case exponent is called the parameter because it's a fixed variable. It, it, it's a variable in the power function, but for the purpose of the family below, the, the, the infinitely many derived functions, we, 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 uh, we froze it in each one of the derived functions, we froze the exponent. Uh, just, just as a comment, Python has a more systematic way to accomplish the same things. It's called uh, partial 
called partial down here, and so you see partial power exponent equals 1 freezes the exponent. Partial power exponent equals 2 freezes the exponent 2, that, 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 that kind of stuff. So this is an idea that, uh, that, that you see in practice. Maybe not in a programming one class, but it's, uh, it's certainly an idea that you see used. I want to talk about it a little more. Specifically, I want to address uniform, uh, doing this uniformly. So, on the left here is a three input function. Three input function. It's not supposed to do much interesting. So, you read in uh, some x0, x1, and x2. You read in x0, x1, x2. You do something, you output something. I, I like I like it when the programs that I write have inputs and outputs, so I usually tack on an output even when it isn't relevant. Okay, now on the right, I froze the first two inputs. I froze x0 at 5, I froze x1 at 7, I partially evaluated. I froze x0 at 5, I froze x1 at 7. So I parameterized x0 to be an x1. And still free is x2. It can be anything it wants. You read in x2 from, from the command line. You need to do something and you output something. The theorem that we're about to do, called the SMN theorem, or sometimes called the parameterization theorem, says that we can go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. We can go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side uniformly. That is to say, there's a program that takes in the index of this and also 5 and 7, and produces the index of this. So if this is, if this is Turing machine 408, my program will take in 408, comma 5, comma 7, and produce the index of this. So this might be program, what did I say? This was program 408, 408. And this might be program over here, might be program 1931. So there is a function, s, which takes in, it's actually, it, it's, it's s sub 2, 1. But anyway, that takes in the 408 and also the 5 and 7 and produces 1931. That is to say, we can parameterize uniformly. We can go from what's on the left to the right with a single program. That's the that's the the content of the SMN theorem, the parameterization theorem. It it, uh, it says there's a program that takes in e five and seven, four oh eight, five and seven, and outputs the index of the Turing machine on the right to nineteen thirty one. Furthermore, it says that a single that that single program works in all of the freeze two and leave one situations. We call that single program we call that S of two comma one. So that's why it's called the SMN theorem, because it's S and M and N. A anyway, so we'll usually dispense with the 2 and the 1 and the M and N. In short, where E is the index of the Turing machine on the left, S of E, comma 5, comma 7 is the index of the machine on the right. Where E is 408, S of E, comma 5, comma 7 is 1931. There's a program that does that. We can uniformly go from the, from the program over here to the parameterized version over here. Okay, so let's, uh, let me bring that up. Universality says there's a computable function that takes the, uh, that, that says there's a computable function that takes in e comma x and, um, uh, and, and has the, behaves like Turing machine e on input x. So the letter E there travels from the function's argument to the index. See how E started in the argument and ended up in the index? The parameterization theorem says something very similar, says, says sort of an extension of that. It says that you can start with a bunch of inputs and then more inputs. And we can freeze the initial inputs at 5, 7, or however many there are, x0 through xm minus 1. We can freeze them to be the constants a0 through am minus 1, over here, a0 through am minus 1. And so they travel, there we go, they travel from the argument, they travel from the argument to the index. It says there is a computable total function, computable. There is a computer program that can do this. 
that can do what we said on the prior slide. There is a computer program that can freeze however many inputs you want there. And what's left is, is still inputs to the new family of functions. Now, the, the part here that, that, that seems to give folks the most trouble um, is not the proof. I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to briefly go through the proof. But the part that seems to give folks the most trouble is that this is in fact, th th this is in fact a family of functions depending on what you froze. Okay, so I'm sorry, where, where, where we go, there we go. So the SMN theorem gives a uniform family of functions. So let me, uh, let me, let me do that first and then we'll go back and do the proof. Okay, so here's the power routine again. So you read the base, you read the exponent, and then you calculate base through the exponent, and then you print out. I like to have output, I just like to have it. Okay? I'm going to freeze exponent. So I'm parameterizing the exponent. First, I freeze it at 0, then I freeze it at 1, then I freeze it at 2, etc., all the way up to freeze it at x, and etc. So, in fact, when you apply the SMN theorem, you don't get one result. You get a family of results parameterized by x. So this is a family of, uh, of Turing machines parameterized by, in this case, the exponent. Okay, so you get infinitely many. Now back in the, in the prior case, in the prior example that we had a couple slides ago, it's doubly parameterized because it's a doubly infinite family because you can freeze x0 to be anything 0, 1, 2, 3. You can freeze x1 to be anything 0, 1, 2, 3. So this is a doubly infinite family, still a family. I gave a particular instance, 1931 program, 1931 is a particular instance of this family, but it's an it's actually there's an infinite family there and I only listed one member. I mean, just because that's how you introduce things is you, you introduce, start small. Okay. Okay, so for the proof. So we're going to produce the function S to satisfy the three requirements. It's got to be effective. It's got to be doable on a Turing machine. It has to be a computer program. It has to input the input, the index S and an M tuple, A0 through AM minus 1, and it also has to output the index of a Turing machine, P hat. So what I called a minute ago, 1931, we're calling here P hat that when given the input uh, xm through xm plus n minus 1 will return the value of, uh, of uh, phi e with the, with the first variables frozen at a0 through am minus 1 and the remaining variables, whatever it was you fed into program p hat, Turing machine, p hat. Okay, and the idea, of course, is that the machine that computes s will construct the instructions for, for p hat. And, uh, and that's on the next slide. So this is the Turing machine that computes, this is the Turing machine that computes, computes S. This is the Turing machine over here, P hat. Okay, so, so what does S do? S, of course, is asked to read in E that's the Turing machine number 408, do you remember from my example? And then the variables, what were they, 5 and 7 in that example? It creates the instruction for, for the Turing machine that, that, you, you, that you want to create the one with the variables frozen at 5 and 7, and then it returns the index of that instruction set. So what is the instructions for P hat? What, what, what's the instructions that I want to do? Well, you remember what P hat has to do. P hat has to take in, in the case of the example that I gave a few minutes ago, P hat has to take in the variables uh, uh, x2, and then it has to execute with x0 equal to 5 and x1 equal to 7. It has to execute Turing machine 408 with x0 equal to 5 and x1 equal to 7. Okay, so here's the idea then. I'm going to, uh, my Turing machine is going to start, when this whole thing starts, it's going to uh, just look like, um, uh, uh, it, it's going to look like just a Turing machine with uh, uh, x2 sitting on the input tape. Uh, when I press the button, what's it going to do? 
Well, when I press the button, what it's going to do is it's going to back up to the left. So it ignores the instructions for a minute, and it backs up to the left, and it puts there a 5 and a 7 separated by blanks, and then another blank, and then whatever you put in for x2. Backs all the way back to the beginning again, and acts like Turing machine number 408, and go. Now, how do I know you can act like term machine number 48? Well, that's universality. So what this fella is doing is it's putting the parameters here onto the tape, backs all the way up to the beginning, and then runs program P sub E on that tape. So, of course, it acts like program PE, so the output will be just what PE would have done. Okay. So, uh, so the idea there is that you, in some sense, simulate PE with, with the inputs given by the parameters, A0 through AM minus 1, the 5 and the 7, with machine P sub 408 that I, I uh, illustrated earlier. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so just, just to step back just for, for 30 seconds before we finish. So we showed that there are problems that no Turing machine can solve. Our job next is to produce a specific problem that no Turing machine can solve. In order to produce that, uh, I need two separate things. The first is I need universality, and the second is I need the SMN theorem. Truth be told, really, the SMN theorem is the thing I need, but I needed universality in order to get the SMN theorem. A anyway, universality and the SMN theorem are both important in their own right. But I, uh, uh, my immediate goal is to have those two things so that I can show the a specific problem, an actual computer job that you would want to solve, but you can't solve it. Okay, and of course we're going to do that next time. So next time we're going to produce a specific problem, not just show there is one, but instead produce a specific problem that no computer can solve. That, to be more precise, we're going to, we're going to produce a function for which there is no Turing machine to compute it. Okay, see you then.